I'm so happy to introduce someone who doesn't really need an introduction to this group, but we want to uh, celebrate her presence with us. Uh, Linda Groff is the Director of Global Options and Evolutionary Futures Consulting, and she is also an Emeritus Professor of Political Science and Future Studies at Cal State Dominguez Hills. She taught there for 40 years, so definitely has broad experience and not only there, but get, that gave her also the platform to go teach in other places as well. So right now she's a speaker, she writes, she teaches, she consults on global futures and evolution, conflict resolution, nonviolence, intercultural interfaith dialogue, and unity, diversity, and spiritual consciousness. You can see a list of her writings in the announcement that uh, Darren sent around. Um, so Linda, without Dr. Linda Groff, without much ado, please take us forward and let's talk about, you know, reframing the reality for the coronavirus, job loss, and racial justice. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here again. I, I think we're going to record this, right? Do you, do you record it? So is somebody? Yeah. Yes, it's, yeah, it's being recording recorded. already. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay. So basically, um, back in April, after the coronavirus started, I decided, you know, I got the idea because I've done peace studies and future studies for years, as well as intercultural interfaith. But I, I realized that there'd be a lot of implications of the coronavirus for both of those fields and then some insights from those fields that could be applied to the virus. So my subtopic is, it, you know, basically the coronavirus, the um, job loss, oh, Ruby just joined, I think, and uh, job loss and racial justice are all very intertwined issues. I don't think they're, they can be separated. And so I'm gonna try to touch a bit on each one of them and how they interrelate. Um, and then, so the first part is going to be just some information on coronavirus, job loss, and and racial issues. And then, um, then the second part will be implications for peace studies. And I do have a peace book coming out. I think maybe now. I don't know if it's going to get out by the end of December or in January. But it's it. Hopefully, at some point, I can come back and share that with all of you when when it's completely published. But that, the title of that is Sustainable uh, Peace Building in a Rapidly Changing World, and then colon, Holistic Evolving Aspects of Peace, Nonviolence, and Community Engagement. So, um, and then later I have this, a futures book, but okay, for the topic today, I have an outline, a pretty detailed outline of what I'm gonna cover. It's in the chat box. So I don't know if you'd wanna you know, copy that and put it in a Microsoft Word document, but that's, that will show you what I'm going to be covering. And then um, if you all see that. And then we have, I have a PowerPoint. Um, and um, Michael is going to have to, um, we're having trouble connecting my PowerPoint um, because it, my, uh, it's, it's, it's screen sharing isn't working. So I, I sent a copy of my PowerPoint. Here it is. If we can get the main part of it. The, the, can we get the first page to show the, the cover, Michael? It's not showing. Is Michael there? I don't hear Michael. Oh, there we go. Okay, and then I don't know if you can make that full screen or not, but if not, it's okay. But is that possible? Maybe not. All right, well, I'll go, you can work on that and I'll, I'll go ahead and start. So, so um, that's my cover page. And as I said, oh, I, I next, I have to, Michael has to do the PowerPoint. I have to say next, so next. Okay, so as I said, there's three parts, information on the virus and related issues and then implications for peace studies and seven evolving aspects of peace from peace studies and then implications for future studies and a, a, a couple different scenarios of, on, on the future. Okay, next. Okay, so their timeline in the virus. Um, I, uh, 
December 31st was when the new virus was emerged in Wuhan, China, in Hubei province of China. And the doctor that first discovered it was, they tried to keep him quiet, but then he eventually died of the virus itself. And then the virus is spread around the world. And what's interesting, by the way, is that the virus, I don't know if you all know this, but the virus that hit the West Coast came from China and the virus that hit the East Coast, like New York, came through Europe and was a mutation. Um, so this virus can mutate. And um, so then later the whole interior of the US has gotten damn, you know, hit by the virus. And, but it started more on the West and the East Coast. And now we have the whole country terribly dealing with it. And we have a real spike in cases happening. And um, so, you know, we're gonna have a very hard time for between December, January and February, people are saying we're gonna have all this spike in cases plus more cases because of people meeting for Thanksgiving and then for Christmas and Hanukkah and so on. So it, this is a kind of critical time and we're way over the number of cases that we should have to get the virus under control. Um, one very interesting tidbit, there's a new book out um, called Rage by um, um, Bradley, you know, water great fame. And what he said is that on February 7th, Trump actually, you know, he, Trump agreed to do a bunch of interviews with him. And he had an interview that day and he shared with Bob Woodward that the coronavirus was at least five times more deadly and, and, and difficult and also airborne and more difficult than the flu and that it really was a big problem. But Trump never has such share that in public with the American people. So he keeps in public, you know, saying everything is fine. It's going to go away. It's more, you know, miraculously is going to miraculously is going to disappear and so on. So he has not been honest with the American public. Next. Okay, just a couple other dates. The World Health Organization declared this a global pandemic on March 11th. March 16th, the U.S. government announced it was the first wave of this of a of the virus and and definitely needed to be taken seriously. And then on May 25th, George Floyd was killed. And that highlighted to everybody the racial injustice in our world and the fact that too many black lives are being lost by police violence, largely. And that, um, and I think that, you know, the coronavirus as it's moved forward, we've become aware of the, the uh, people of color, whether they're black, Latino, Native American, whatever, or in prisons, people, you know, of many different situations and the poor and homeless, all of them are suffering at much higher rates from this virus than other people. So if you have inequality before the virus, then the virus has exacerbated that. Even though I'm gonna argue later that what we, the values that we need in order to deal effectively with the virus are that we need to all come together and realize that everybody is important and needs to be attended to. Um, but the virus at the moment is taking a bigger toll definitely on people of color. Okay, the next here are different time periods for looking at the virus. Um, Thomas Friedman had an, or, an article in the LA in the New York Times um, and he said there's, we're gonna have two different historical periods, BC before the coronavirus and AC after it. And then I extended it to say, maybe there's really three periods. One is before the virus, one is during the virus, trying to deal with it now. And then um, the third stage will be after the virus is over and we get control of it. And that's not gonna be that until at least 60, 70% of the population in this country has um, antibodies to protect against the virus because they've had vaccines, had vaccines the virus. virus. I'm hearing an echo. Oh dear. Michael, and then there's, okay, so, so, and then the, the important thing is the whole world has to somehow be vaccinated or people get the virus and survive because otherwise, you know, it, it can be spread from country to country. Next. So those are the three periods. And for the US, I would say the period before the, the virus was dominated by the Trump administration and its values, which I'll look at later. And then during the virus, we still have Trump doing, actually he's been AWOL, um, not doing anything, especially since the election, but even I'll, I'll share a little bit later for quite a while, he hasn't been doing a whole lot. Um, so, um, okay, the next, go ahead. 
So the values that we need, as I said, are, are quite different to deal effectively with the virus than the values that Trump exhibits, unfortunately. Now there's two terms which you may all know, containment stage and mitigation stage. Do you know those terms? Containment is if you ideally you know, start dealing with the virus and contain it right from the beginning. So you have to have testing of everybody. You have to get results back quickly. You have to um, have follow-up for anyone who tests positive and, and do contact tracing of all the people they've been in contact with lately and then get them to also do quarantine for 14 days. I think now they're saying seven to 10 days quarantine. Um, but you know we were not on top of it at the beginning because basically Trump was trying to say everything was fine and it will disappear. But um, the mitigation stage is what you have to do later is if you didn't get on top of it at the beginning. And then um, you have to try to do things like get everybody to wear masks, social distancing, um, all those wash your hands, you know, um, don't gather in too big groups, all these types of things. Um, and, um, and then you still have to try to get, you know, testing. I mean, we're still as a country not doing a good job testing everybody and getting results back quickly is another thing that's really important. So, um, so we've been, we had the first stage at the beginning, then there was another stage uh, uh, increased in, in the summer. And then now in November, December, we're almost like in a third, third wave, you could say, of this virus, uh, maybe in the US. Um, so, okay, next. Um, all right, so there's huge economic impacts of the virus. Obviously, and in many different industries have been hit really badly. All the travel industry, airlines, hotels, et cetera, restaurants, bars, gyms, salons. Um, and um, we've had a stimulus in the past, a couple, but now we're still waiting to try to have another one, which would be a big help. And local governments and states are also hit really badly and many, many more unemployed people now, as you all know. Um, the recovery is not a V-shape, it's a K-shape, which means that the K, for some people, there's a small group of people that are wealthy and at, at home and, and, and pretty safe from the virus so far and have stock options and you know are doing well. And then there's other people who are hurting really badly, who are unemployed, losing their jobs, getting sick with the virus. And so that's why it's called a K-shaped. Uh, effect. So it is not by any means equal to everyone, even though everyone's vulnerable to the virus, but it is absolutely not hit everybody equally by any means. Next. Okay, a few more things. Um, well, I mean, the whole world is affected by the virus, but you know, we're, 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 we're a very bad example in terms of dealing effectively with it. South Korea is a country, if you want to look at, that's done quite well in upfront from the beginning in dealing with the virus and some Asian countries. Um, okay, then um, the econ this is really important. I mean, Trump wanted to just deal with the economy because he thought it would help him get reelected but in, and just ignore the virus more or less. But the truth is that until we deal effectively with the virus, it's destroying our economy. So we have to get a handle on the virus if we want the economy to come back and to really move into a new post-normal stage which will not just be what it was before because if people will have been through too much. Um, so there's a number of vaccines on the horizon um, and you've been hearing about them on the news from um, 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 Moderna, but the, and Pfizer and Mo Pfizer just started, I think it was Wednesday, or no, Tuesday, they did the first shot in the world in the UK with elderly people with Pfizer. And I, I think it's going pretty well so far. And then they also have Moderna coming along and those have both have to be approved but that's in the process of approval in the US government. Um, and then we have AstraZeneca, but um, anyway, uh, um, so, okay, the next. Um, so the unequal uh, medical and economic impacts of the virus on different racial ethnic minorities is becoming extremely, uh, obvious, including for Blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans, plus poor, homeless, prisoners, etc. So in terms of um, minorities being hit more, it's partly because they're much more the essential workers who are on the front lines working everywhere to keep our lives going. 
so they're more exposed. And of course, health workers also, you have a lot of minorities sometimes in health work in hospitals. And, um, and then also um, sometimes poor people have less access to health insurance, so that makes them more vulnerable. And if people live in uh, crowded housing conditions, um, this is Anthony's topic, housing, but then that's also can spread the virus more. Next. So, um, so this is a few figures I found about the virus. Um, so 60% um, of black households, wait, let me rephrase this here. There's a national survey they did and they found that the percentage of households facing serious financial problems because of COVID um, varies by different racial ethnic groups. So um, black households are, have 60% of black households, including 41% um, have used up all their savings and 10% had no savings, but 60% of black households are facing financial difficulties because of the virus. 72% of Latino households, also 55% of Native American households versus 36% of white households. So you can see that the financial impact of the virus on families varies a great deal. Next. Um, so 60% so of businesses, small businesses, um, nearly 100,000 establishments are closed temporarily from the virus right now in the US. So a whole lot of just small businesses have gone out of business and every time you have another hit in a big wave of the virus, you know, if it, 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 it leads to more people losing their businesses. And another thing, place, place hurting a lot are state and local governments, which have had to fund all the costs of the virus and gotten some help from the federal government. But, you know, because Trump refused to develop a national plan to deal with the virus, all the different states and their governors and people had to compete with each other to get supplies for needed supplies for nurses, doctors, hospitals, et cetera. And, you know, ventilators and all these things earlier. And so that also increased the cost that's, that state and local governments have had to shoulder. And so then if they keep getting cut back, you know, then they're gonna have to cut back on jobs as well for lots of people, including teachers, you know, that work for the state as well, or cities and, and, and police and firemen and so on. So there's a lot of ripple effects of all of this. Okay, the next is, uh, this is, when I started looking at this earlier, I tried to just look at what are the values that the Trump administration exhibits versus the values that are needed if we're gonna deal effectively with this virus and cooperate. And so, you know, I, I'm gonna go through these quickly, but, you know, Trump has tried to divide and polarize instead of bringing people together. He focuses more on just focusing on supporting his base versus bringing everybody that everybody's important to deal with the virus. Um, he's included racist sexism and white nationalism in terms, instead of trying to empower everybody of all backgrounds. And he's, he blames others, minorities and women for the, all his problems and instead of taking, you know, learning to take responsibility for our own actions and learn from that. I think the biggest problem also is Trump has a win-lose mentality and what we need is win-win. Next, you know, so that, and then, um, okay, yeah. And then science, you know, like I think Anthony talked about this, uh, truth doesn't have any commitment to facts or truth or, or science as opposed to those being very important and essential to solving the coronavirus challenge. And democracy, Trump is not, doesn't seem to understand the rule of law or democracy in our democratic institutions, especially lately, which I won't go into now, but you know, democracy is quite imperfect, but it's still important to try to defend it. So next. Okay, so Trump um, has, um, where well, there's a page missing, I think before this. The, yeah, okay. In terms of just statistics, the U.S. has 4% of the world's population, but 20% of the world's cases, and sometimes I read 25%. Um, and the U.S., we have 15.9 million cases now, and 293,000 people have died, whereas globally, we have 69.5 million cases so far, and 1.5 million people have died. So... Um, 
you know, and the and as I said, the worst is ahead of us during these winter months of, of December, January, February. So those figures are going to keep going up. And we just don't have, a, we're not in control of the virus right now. Um, maybe later Simon Simonian's on, he might say something about this, but um, basically, um, you know, we're, we're in a bad situation right now. And so it's more important than ever that people take it, you know, do wear masks and social distancing and all of that. And some people just refuse to do it and say that it's a the virus is a democratic hoax, which is like ridiculous. So a few things that Trump leadership didn't do very well. Um, so um, he, he wanted to reopen the economy and schools um, too quickly. Um, and um, let me just, I'm just trying to see here. Um, I, Trump advocated kind of quack medicine, like things like bleach and hydrochloroquine, which, you know, isn't helpful for getting rid of the virus. And he's politicized the issue and tried to divide people and, and, and created the biggest problem is Trump keeps creating super spreader events, either at the White House or different rallies next. And that's not helping at all either. So he hasn't provided a good model of national leadership, which you are all quite aware of, I'm sure. Um, and then um, it, it, when, when Trump earlier tried to reopen schools and the, well, in the economy and schools, we were having like 40,000 new cases a day. And Dr. Fauci said we should be down to maybe 10,000 new cases a day if we wanted to really control things, but we weren't. So we kind of reopened too soon. And now we're having, first we were up to like 100,000 and then 150,000. We've gotten close to 100 and 90, 200,000 cases a day happening on certain days. So we're really going in the wrong direction in terms of the number of cases right now. Um, and so Trump was AWOL, I would say, on the, on the coronavirus since June when he stopped meeting with his coronavirus task force, like five or six months ago was the last time he met with them. And then um, since August, because he then he got involved with the, what's his name, Dr. Um, what's his name, Scott, not Axel, you know who I mean. The, Atlas. He got, it, what is it? Atlas. Atlas, that's right. Scott <laughs> Atlas was somebody that was promoted herd immunity theory and Sweden has tried to that theory, but the herd immunity theory is basically just let every, try to isolate old people who might be more vulnerable to just let everyone else get the virus and don't do anything to stop it. And then eventually you'll develop her herd immunity when 60 to 70% of the population has the virus <clears throat> and the antibodies. The problem is the theory doesn't work because you can't separate old people. You've got to have young people take care of them and so on. And, and it just, it hasn't worked in Sweden. They had to finally give up on it there too. So it, but that's what Trump was trying to do since August. And, um, and now since the election, He's doing nothing. He plays golf every day, tweets fake information, and and challenges the election results. And and um, so there's just a lack of national leadership right now. I'll, you know, so so okay. The next is Biden Harris goals are to you know create a ta they've already created a task force of, of good scientific medical experts, and they're relying on science, not quack theories, and the, and. And Biden says he will rejoin the World Health Organization, which Trump withdrew us from. I mean, in the middle of a pandemic to withdraw from the World Health Organization doesn't sound very wise to me. Okay, and there's a three point plan that Biden hopes to deliver in his first 100 days. Um, so he wants to require everybody in federal buildings or on trains or buses or wherever to wear masks and to ask everyone else to wear masks and so on. Uh, the next one is to have at least 100 million um, COVID vaccine shots done by then, but it's not clear if we're going to have enough of the medicine for that. Um, and then the third thing is to, he wants to try to get a majority of schools to reopen within the first 100 days and stay open, because that will then help families to be able to go back to work as well. And younger people don't seem to get the virus as much or spread it as much, it seems at the moment, as uh, the latest we know as um, older people. Okay, next. 
Timeline for development of a vaccine. Well, you've all heard this on the news a whole lot lately, but there's, I, I saw somewhere that over 100 vaccines are being developed, but the two most promising we know about are Pfizer and Moderna, which are based on a different method of developing a vaccine based on RNA, not DNA. And um, anyway, that, that, that's most of those are coming and getting government approval soon so they can, we can start. But they, especially Pfizer, requires a really cold temperatures to keep it. So the, there's a big issues of distributing the virus, not just that you have the virus, but you have to get it in people's arms and um, and you have to protect it too in transport and so on. So the people in the U.S. who will get the vaccine first first are healthcare workers, and then elderly, I believe, um, with pre-existing conditions, and then essential workers, I think, will be next. And um, I went to a grocery store a couple of times and the, 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 there's somebody working there who wrote, had a t-shirt that said, I'm proud to be an essential worker. Okay. So, and then eventually uh, educators are also important because they have to be with students and uh, workers in all kinds of different industries, food, grocery, drugstore, postal centers, you know, garbage collection, all kinds of people we depend on just to keep the economy going during all this. And so, um, you know, there's a whole, it's going to take a while to roll out all the shots for people, which people are saying probably won't be till, you know, spring, uh, late spring, possibly, or later that we start getting everybody vaccinated. And then there's another issue I've got somewhere here of anti-vaxxers who don't want a vaccine uh, and don't trust it because they have heard all kinds of conflicting information from the government. Uh, next. Um, there's also a question how long the immunity is once you get the vaccine. Um, oh, that's the second part. I think, let me just say the anti-vaxxers, I mean, I've never gotten a flu shot myself, but I, I will get this vaccine if it's available and I can get it only because, you know, I'm not 20 years old anymore and I'd rather not get this virus if I can help it, but everyone has to decide for themselves. And you have to get 60 to 70% of the population vaccinated or having had the virus and have antibodies in order to develop herd immunity, not by just letting the virus run rampant, but by also having the vaccine available for hopefully more and more people. Okay, the second part, how much time am I, how am I doing? This is, I'm looking at now at implications for peace studies. So peace, you know, I have a peace book, as I said, coming out, but I look at peace as visions and goals for society in the world that if we could enact these goals would help to create cultures of peace on planet earth and more peaceful societies. So, so the big question for me, I have seven evolving aspects of peace that I worked on with my late husband and that I, so I'm gonna to try to look at each of those quickly and just look at some of the implications of how the coronavirus is impacting each of these different aspects of peace. Um, okay, so this is a diagram across the top of the seven types of peace going across. And my late husband was Paul Smoker. He was in peace studies all his life in English. Um, okay, next. Next. Okay, these are, well, these are listing. I'm just going to keep going next because I have time constraints. But there's war prevention. Okay, the first type of peace is is creating, you know, eliminating war and also physical violence. And what, if we look at the coronavirus, we can say we're having a battle, a war with it, but it's a totally different types of enemy. It's an invisible enemy, but it's an existential threat to us, to people's lives nonetheless. And so, um, and people now are also experiencing COVID fatigue, like getting, getting tired of war, but this is not the time to give up because you know the, these three months now are going to be some of the worst we have to go through. Um, so um, let's see here. Well, I've already. I'm not going to repeat myself. So we need to, you know, be still serious about wearing masks and social distancing and everything. Um, and and in the future there could be, you know, people say that probably every decade we get a new big like virus, coronavirus type thing. We've had SARS, AIDS, et cetera, in the past. And, you know, so this won't be the last time and we need to have the government be in place. Now, Obama administration had, a, 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 you know, things set up to deal with the virus, but when Trump came in, he got rid of that. So we weren't as prepared as we might've been. Okay, next. 
The next is international institutions, that peace requires supporting international institutions where people can go and solve their differences and conflicts and problems and not go back, hopefully, to a state of war. So in the international realm, the key in, uh, organization here is the World Health Organization um, and in terms of dealing with COVID-19. And as I said, Trump stopped funding that and also withdrew the US from that. But Biden is um, committed to rejoining that, I think, on day one and to cooperating more with other countries to defeat the virus, which is very important. Um, so, I mean, this is interesting to me. The, the coronavirus is a value which absolutely requires everybody in the whole planet being important and being dealt with. And, and so we can't sort of just say only some people are important and not other people because otherwise we'll never deal with the virus. Okay, next. Okay, the third is not just eliminating uh, war and physical violence, but eliminating structural violence which is in, in creating social justice on macro levels. But structural violence, structural violence exists when people, um, when the structure of the system doesn't meet people's needs when it potentially could, okay? So the key fact here is that there's, you know, what we're, we're facing, worsening inequities already, you know, in society are being exacerbated and made worse by the virus. Um, and um, I think another thing, well, with Trump, of course, with what he's appealed to is white, white racism and, you know, white, what is it, white nationalism, white supremacy. Um, and we had eight years of Obama, which is the first black president, which I guess must have freaked a few people out. But, you know, good God, we've got to come together as a human family. And so that's the bottom line. And um, Michael is working, his, his whole email is about anti-racism. So good for you, Michael. Anyway, I think another thing I will say that is important to note is this right-wing political trend that Obama's part, not Obama, that Trump is part of is also a global trend, which is something I'm concerned about. If you look at all the following countries, they have right-wing, I would call almost like neo-fascist, nationalist, populist movements where you elevate the dominant group in your society and then you try to, you know, denigrate and blame the minorities in your country for, for the problems your country is facing. And you have leaders in a lot of these countries that are also promoting that. So you had Brexit in the UK, you have Hungary, Poland, Russia under Putin, China under Xi, the Philippines under Duarte, um, India under Moti, Brazil under um, Bolsonaro. I mean, all of those countries have this also kind of right-wing trends right now. So those of us interested in peace have to really look and figure out what in the world is going on that this trend has happened. You know, when we talked about 20, the year 2000, everyone talked about global interdependence. And now what we have is the exact opposite with these right-wing nationalist movements and they are dangerous. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to make that point. And because if you're gonna cooperate with everybody being important in a society. Israel um, is right-wing. What? Did I put Israel well, is right wing? I, well, I'm just saying under, um, you know, what, um, you know, the prime minister of Israel is. Bibi. Pretty, I'm just talking about Bibi, not the whole country. But I would say that he's pretty, he's part of nationalism on the right, wouldn't you have to say? Okay. Um, all right. The next one is um, gender peace, where we. Um, eliminate physical and structural violence. This is the fourth type of piece on macro and micro community and family le levels. So the idea here is that you can't have peace in the world if you don't also deal with what's happening in your own communities and family. You can't just deal with the macro big picture level and not, not deal because you, you, your foundation for peace also exists in your families and communities and what people are learning and the opportunities they have there. So I did recently find something by a woman who said the pandemic is also um, is clear how much of the economy relies on unpaid labor, mostly un uh, shouldered by women, as well as the undervalued jobs in female dominated industries. So how can governments now start to elevate these jobs and weave them into broader economic growth indices? So she's trying to figure out how unpaid labor could be important and given value in like GNP and other things like that. 
and her name is Mariana Mazzucato, but apparently she's getting some, you know, people are listening to her. So this is kind of interesting. But anyway, so women are more likely to be laid off soon. By this type of piece, gender piece is not just about women though. It's about all women and minorities and giving opportunities really to everybody uh, to get education, to have some jobs, et cetera. But so women get, tend to get laid off sooner than men. Some women today are leaving the workforce because they wanna, they have to take care of their kids at home if, if the kids are home because of the virus. And, and not in school, et cetera. And poor, poorer women often have to work even if it's a, you know, they're more exposed to the virus because otherwise they have no income for their families. And so a lot of you know, essential workers also that includes. And then women and men, you know, all I said essential workers are also out there every day still working for the rest of us. Okay, next type of piece. So, Okay, the fifth type of piece is intercultural piece. The last three types of piece my late husband and I framed as positive if, from a holistic uh, evolving systems point of view. And it, the idea here is that you can't change the world if you only look at what you wanna get rid of, you have to also have a clear vision of what you wanna create as an alternative. So we need to create intercultural peace between the diversity of the world's peoples. And again, the virus is going to be affecting everybody um, whether whatever your background, your, your diverse background is. And so we have to um, hold up the importance that all people can get uh, medical care and medical assistance to deal with this virus in not just the US, but globally. Okay, um, and there's still many refugees in the world fleeing war and famine and so on and all exposed as well to the virus. Um, all right, the, the next one is under, under here. I, I think, as I said, there's a battle going on globally between forces um, trying to bring people together versus trying to sort of create right-wing right populist movements which are not honoring all the members of their population. So we have to somehow figure out how we get back to honoring, you know, all, him, all people are important. And, and all different backgrounds of people. The intercultural field, by the way, there's a whole field of intercultural communication and interfaith dialogue that relates to this, but it's about also bringing the gifts, I, the way I look at it, that all different cultures on the planet have different gifts to bring to humanity today. And we need to be able to allow that to happen so that everyone can benefit from that and that nobody has all the answers and everybody has some of the answers. All right, um, so, um, Let's go on to the next one. Yeah. The next, Michael. Yeah. The next is peace with the earth, which we call Gaia peace, but between humans and all the other species that inhabit earth, and many of which are endangered today because humans are taking over more and more of the earth. And so this, I just want to, what, the most thing I want to say here is we don't just have a COVID crisis. We also have an environmental um and, and a climate change crisis. And this is probably not getting as much attention lately because everyone's so consumed with the COVID virus, but we absolutely have to get back to this and much more seriously than we've been dealing with that. Because both of these are existential crisis, crises, meaning they, they endanger our future humanity and evolution and survival and, and people are, or dying and you know we've already seen in California more terrible fires and in the Gulf areas much worse um, hurricanes and so on that are all product of climate change so we need to realize that this is also extremely important that we can't forget this and then the last one next I mean the last type of piece is inner peace finding not just dealing with all these types of outer peace but inner peace and here I would say that everybody because of COVID is under, are under more stress. Uh, sometimes people living together at home for long periods, there's increases, in, you know, it's hard to escape other members of the family. There's more domestic violence, there's more suicides, there's more addictions um, happening because of the virus, which is, you know, there's also kids are, are having big effects on their learning by, not being in school and being at home trying to, you know, and there's a, I don't have the figures. There's a lot, there's a certain number of kids that are just completely dropped out of the educational system. They're not even trying to do online learning. And um, so that's another problem. And um, 
So and basically prayer and meditation are things that people can use to try to find some inner peace and some moments when they can, you know, block out the outside world and, and try to find some peace, peace within. Um, another thing I, you know, I've, I mentioned healthcare workers, I think are increasingly exhausted and some of them experiencing PTSD that they're gonna have to deal with after this crisis is over. So I think, and there's also a lot of grieving and healing still to be done. Um, a lot of people haven't had opportunities to, to heal with members of their families they've lost. And so there's going to be lasting wounds that people are going to be dealing with because of all this, that we have, a, we need more national leadership to at least help people realize they're not alone. So basically the conclusions on impacts of peace are that the world keeps changing and we have to keep evolving as new issues come up um, in terms of peace and so on. Um, and, um, but the virus is at the moment impacting all aspects of our lives and a few of the ways I've tried to illustrate. And it's certainly also impacting all these different aspects of peace. So um, we're not out of the woods yet, but we have to, as they say, what perseverance furthers in the I Ching. So uh, we could, if we have time later, we could even talk about what are the important lessons that we as a human race need to learn from this darn, these triple crises right now. Okay, the last part, how am I doing on time? The last part are implications for future studies. Do I have a few you, minutes? You still, yeah, you have about five, 10 minutes. Okay, great, everything's good. Okay, so I've done future studies for years as well. And there are a few people, by the way, who are both peace studies and future studies people. I'm not the only one. Elise and Kenneth Boldings, um, some of you are Quakers, might know those names. Huh? Yeah. What? I, I don't know what that noise is. Okay, the next thing is so in, so future a few points about future studies because people think futures predict the future, but they actually don't claim to predict the future. But that's what people keep telling them they should be doing. But basically, they claim yeah, uh, whoever has the phone that ends in six five two two has to mute. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks. Um, so basically futures look at that, that, that there are many alternative futures, not just one. And we talk about possible, probable, preferable futures. So possible futures are anything that could happen in the future, which is a whole lot of things. Probable futures are what are most likely to happen and preferable futures are what we would most like to, to have happen. So the goal is to make preferable futures more probable. All right. And so futurist, um, can look at the future of anything and everything. However, um, you know, futurists tend to look at changes as they interact with in different areas over time. So, you know, looking at evolving interdependent whole systems perspectives are what futurists try to do next. So change is accelerating today and humans I think are also organizing over time, like we as on ever bigger system levels with more diversity in them every time. So we started with little, little roving bands and then tribes, and then we had ancient beginning of agriculture and villages, and then we got the rise of ancient civilizations and then empires, and then we get feudalism and then the nation state system. And now we have global interdependence, but also regional things, but we're also starting to leave the earth and go out to space. So, you know, I think over time, you know, we're, what we're trying to do today is bring humanity together more, but right now some of the trends seem to be going in the other direction, but we really, seems to be very important that we keep, not lose that goal. So the futures field has funny, has different, oh, back again, one more, I'm sorry, Michael. Um, the, the future hasn't happened yet, which is a strange field. So they've, there's, but there's a lot of methodologies that futures have developed to look at um, the future. And um, yeah, the, go, go the next. Um, and um, so it, it one, I think one goal of futures, which overlaps with peace studies is to empower people to see, to better understand change. And in the process of that have, see more opportunities in change to improve their situation and those of other people in the world. So there's an overlap of future studies and peace studies, but future studies is a bit broader because it looks at the future of anything and everything. Um, and then uh, next, next, okay. 
Um, so there's a famous saying, and this is a book book that Elise Bowling and Kenneth Bowling, as I said, were famous peace researchers, and also um, um, what's his name? Um, oh, I'll, I'll come back to his name in a second. But th but these are you know they they come out of the Quaker background, and um, so a civilization without positive images of itself is doomed. So in terms of the future, if we want to create a better alternative future, we have to not just know what we want to get rid of which is important, but we have to have a clear vision, alternative vision of what we wanna create because otherwise you just keep getting upset at the ways things are, but you don't know where you wanna to go to create as an alternative. And Elise Boulding, as I said, is a famous futurist and peace researcher and futurist. She used to do futures peace workshops. So she would get people to envision a desirable nonviolent world 30 years in the future and how, and then really think about how it works and how it functions, and then ask people to look back and determine the steps that people had to go through to get from where they are now to where they wanna be in the future. So I would just say we could look at, you know, use that as a kind of model perhaps to, to look at what would be the future we wanna create post COVID, you know, and, and then what are the steps we wanna to do to get there, but also in different types of peace as well. Okay, next. Okay, so there's a couple, there's many futures methodologies. I'll just mention a couple. One is trend extrapolation. You see where the trends are going and if they're getting worse, it, t it should be telling you that you need to intervene and change what you're doing or you're gonna keep getting things will keep getting worse. Uh, but another is scenarios, which is a possible sequence of events that could happen in the future. And futurists always say you should always do at least two or three different scenarios, not only one you know, because there's not just one future, there's different alternative futures. And so each scenario starts with different initial conditions and you, and you give the, you know, how those conditions could be established. And one could be, you know, a, a, like a, a most probable case scenario, just repeating where we are right now, but you could have a best case scenario and then you could have a worst case scenario and so on. So there's different types of scenarios that help people to look at what the future would be, you know, depending on how initial conditions are and then the sequence of events that follows from that and then how people in, interact with those events. Next. Okay, so I tried to do a very quick version of a couple uh, COVID best case, worst case, mixed case scenarios. Um, best case scenario is that everybody takes the virus very seriously and starts practicing all the, you know, wearing masks, social distancing, et cetera. And that we get on top of having um, testing for everybody. And that when you test positive, you immediately quarantine yourself and you do contact tracing afterwards, you know, to find out who that person has been in touch with. And then you have them also self, self isolate for up to 14 days. I mean, that would be the ideal. We're sort of quite far from that right now, but that's a best case scenario. And then the worst case scenario is that people just don't take anything seriously. Like basically Trump is not, one thing Trump, I give credit for, he did, you know, push, you know, what's this rapid, he has a name for trying to get a, a speed up getting vaccine, vaccines developed. Um, but I don't think he's got a very good plan for all the rollout of how you distribute the vaccines, which is also extremely important. But the worst case scenario is you don't have any national leadership and people, you know, a lot of Trump supporters are people that go to the hospital and they claim that the virus doesn't exist even though they're sick with it themselves because they've been told by Trump that it's not important and that it's, that it's a democratic hoax or all these other things. So it's not, that's the kind of thing that's quite dangerous and that is making it difficult to, you know, and creates super spreader events still going on and so on. And then the mixed case or most probable case scenario might be where some people take things seriously and other people don't. And my conclusion about that would be that then you still keep spreading the virus and then you, st you, know, you don't get a handle on it as quickly and you get more cases and more deaths happening and more hospitalizations and so on. Um, so you don't totally get it under control. So it's not, a, quite a, it's not enough that half the population takes it seriously and half of the people don't. So that's the kind of warning for the future. And then I did three parallel things for climate change here, because as I said, this is just as, as important a crisis on our horizon. And the best case would be that everybody takes the, the climate change very seriously and follows the, the UN sustainable development goals. And then also the 
Paris Climate Agreement goals, but then those now people say we have to go way beyond those, even if we're going to deal with climate change. Um, and the, you know the things that that's creeping up very fast as a problem. Worst case scenario is people don't do this, and and then we start having really terrible things like oceans rising, you know, cities on the coast being flooded, tons of refugees going all over, and then much more conflict in the world. People looking for places to live and food and shelter and so on. And that is a horrible scenario that if we possibly can avoid it, we really need to do that. And the, a mixed case scenario again is that some people, you know, try to follow the, the UN sustainable development goals and support, you know, climate, the Paris climate agreement and so on. And then other people don't. And right now, you know, the US has been withdrawn from the Paris climate agreement and, you know, Trump doesn't seem to like international things. He seems to want to support nationalism. But, you know, his policies have not been make America great. His policies on COVID have not made America great or better. They've done the opposite. So I'm, I have, I guess, strong views about Trump and whether, <laughs> which I think you all know. <laughs> okay. Speak, sister, speak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I've done a, I did another talk to this group earlier on nonviolent resistant movements in the age of Trump. And I looked at all the different groups, the ethnic, everybody is not white, all different groups and women that Trump has dumped on. And, you know, and then we also have institutions that, that Trump has also tried to, you know, our democratic institutions are in danger. I mean, what yeah. Trump is doing right now is just horrendous in my view. He, I mean, he yeah. just absolutely, I mean, it's the most undemocratic. He has not a clue what our country's about in terms of our constitution, our democracy. It's been very imperfect, but for God's sakes, it's better than uh, his being our dictator. And so, you know. So I'm, Linda, yeah. I wonder if we could open it up now for sure. questions. Are you That's at a fine. point? It sounds have, like you're at the end here, huh? Yeah, there's a, the, 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 the last one, I have a poem, but I don't know if there's time to read it that I wrote about the coronavirus. You Should can I read, read it the now? poem as your conclusion and then we'll open it up if you well, have. Yeah, to. okay, let me see if I, I can. just tell people while she's reading the poem, raise your hand in the participant list or you right. know, let us know. All right, very quickly, I wrote this back in April it's called Conflicting Values in the Age of Corona. Okay, so I'm just gonna do this rather quickly. Every once in a while I write poems, but you know, I like to do that. So, okay, Corona, Corona, what a puzzle you pose. Shall we reopen our economy before our health is assured? How quickly is it safe to return to jobs and to school when adequate twisting, testing is not yet available? If going back to work is initiated too soon, the virus can spread more with a second fall wave. Then it's back to our homes to self-isolate once again um, with further negative consequences to our economic well-being. Although I think right now we're not trying to have everyone stay at home, but, but we're trying to have people follow these guidelines more. So the rest of the poem. So what shall it be, our health or our jobs? Neither choice is risk-free, a most difficult conundrum. Until a vaccine is available, we remain at the mercy of this virus and its impacts upending our lives. The most challenging time for all humanity on the earth, on this earth, can we all work together to find solutions for all that will lessen the burden and the stress on us all as we navigate through these unknowns? Oh, good God, let's hope so. And then I'm almost done. Both science and spirit are important on this journey. The experts must speak while we keep our spirits intact. But evolution is a way when new challenges appear to unleash creative new ventures that move humanity forward. The old must give way to the new and the different. Adaptation is essential along with creative new ideas. Only then will we discover new stages in our lives and a new human future awaiting us all. And that is it. Amen. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't realize you also were a poet. So sometimes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for ending that way and for yeah. the very uh, fact that you mentioned this future planning and future scenarios is really important uh, to think about because we often just want to move. We don't like what's there, but we don't really plan and think about what's the future that we want. Uh, and I think that resonates with a lot of us here in the left wing side of the political uh, spectrum. 
so thank you. I see several hands. Uh, uh, we'll, I have so far Rick, Rose, Carol Francis, Steve Brody, and Simon lifting his personal hand. And so I'll take them in that order. Simon, I did see your hand. Uh, we'll start with Rick Banales. Thank you very much for that talk. It, it, it's, it's very enlightening. And, and um, I, I think one thing that um, people forget, and we've forgotten this over generations, actually, I think since uh, Edward Teller said it, uh, one of the down, one of the things that will probably be the downfall of the human race is the inability to understand the exponential function that um, we don't understand how nature works in that way. And um, I, I think one of the things that made it very clear for me last week, uh, or at, earlier this week, a statistic I saw, about 8,000 people die a day in the United States uh, on the average through various um, causes of demise. The list of additional, uh, of deadliest days for additional unique casualties on record was um, number one for the Galveston hurricane, um, uh, which was 8,000 deaths. The second was Antietam, 3,600. Number three was yesterday, 3,100 deaths from COVID. We, uh, we need to be able to talk about this issue in those terms, we need to be able to um, be, be able to show COVID-19 um, uh, wards in hospitals where people are on ventilators, where they're, um, you know, it, it's a horrible way to show somebody, but, you know, um, basically comatose and having to deal with every bodily function through, uh, as you would with someone who's comatose. Um, how, you know, when you check in, that might be the last time that you see any family members. Um, I, I think that inability to make it so personal and make it so confrontive is one of the issues that we're having. Um, and, you know, of course, we have an administration that understands that, um, you know, <laughs> that the stock market rides on, um, on, on the, you know, on the investor class and not on um, the, 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 the general populace. So uh, I just want to say that and, 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 you know, get, get the, get that information out there. Uh Linda, you're muted, so we couldn't answer your hear your response to Rick. Oh, I just want to say, a yeah, futures look a lot at exponential growth, which is an equal percentage uh, growth from from year to year, whatever. And it it creeps up. It looks like it's starting out slowly, but it suddenly takes off, and you get the a curve that just goes way up like this. And 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 a lot of the crises facing the world today are exponential, and that's why you know we have all these crises happening too because we're not planning ahead of time enough to deal with them. Yeah, thank you, Rick, for that, for that, those statistics. I saw those yesterday and I was just appalled. Uh, Rose Leibowitz. Yes, uh, thank you for your wonderful overview of what's been going on in the last year. It was really good. But there's one thing I just wish to kind of um, mention. I mean, Trump may have been wandering around his golf course and worrying about whether he had the vote stolen from him but either he or his administration are working overdrive to pass all sorts of very nasty laws like opening areas to um, mining that, you know, they'll have the contract signed before Biden takes over. I mean, there is so much going on that I, he may himself be playing golf, but the uh, systems he's set in place are definitely still being very destructive. No, I totally agree with you. And I'm, I'm I, he's almost trying to leave every branch of the government in worse shape that, you know, or not have Biden be able to be totally prepared on day one. And it's a very, I mean, we still have till January 20th to deal with Trump in the White House, you know, and I, I mean, I don't know what all, I mean, right now he's trying to undermine the whole darn democracy. 
I mean, that, yep. you know, just for a little thing, you yeah. know, like, I mean, it's just astounding to me what he's trying to do now. And, and having the it's Texas scary. AG can have a lawsuit against AGs in other states mm -hmm. to try to tell them how they should be voting and then go to the Supreme Court and ask them to overturn the election results in like four different swing states where they've already certified their elections. I mean, it's just, it's so, I mean, I can't even believe it. It's so preposterous. Yeah. And, and it's very dangerous because, you know, he, it's dangerous because his followers believe him. I mean, it's, and I don't know, they just watch Fox News and now they're switching from Fox News to, what is it, Mac, what is it, um, Newsmax, Newsmax, which is even further right wing than, than Fox. I mean, it's, I mean, you know, and if, and when Biden takes office, he's going to have to deal with all this and he's going to try to get everyone to wear a mask, but whether he can get all the Trump people to, to go along, I, you know, I, I mean, it, it's just, you would think in a democracy, you, you know, you're supposed to try to, after the election, you're supposed to have a transition and then have the old, you know, people help the transition of the new people taking power. And then you're supposed to try to have the person who becomes president make some effort to try to bring the country together, you know? And, and of course we've had none of that from Trump. And it's just, I mean, it's just appalling to me. I, I can't even tell you how horrified this makes me. Uh, Carol Francis. Yes. Um, thank you, Linda, it was fantastic. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned the right wing governments and you named them and talked about how that affects the world health. I'd like you to talk more on the left governments like Cuba and Cyrus and how US policy towards these people or against these people affect, um, affect the corona crisis and sanctions on countries like Cuba and Iran and others and how that affects mm. the coronavirus? Well, that's a good question. And I'm not sure I can answer it as adequately as you would like, um, because I didn't look into that yet. <laughs> so, but I mean, I think, um, you know, but the only thing I can say is that Trump has just tried to look at everything in terms of promoting, he's saying America first, but he's really talking about, I just support people who support me, you know, and that's about it. And so obviously he's not reaching out to any other countries. And I, I think the thing about Iran, and now Cuba, I'm not sure about, but that's an interesting question. But in terms of Iran, um, you know, the, I think Biden may try to rejoin the, the, the Iran um, you know, the anti-nuclear agreement and bring it back. But, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how, you know, all the Trump people are against that. So, um, you know, it's a dangerous thing, you know, and, um, you know, meanwhile, Iran has, you know, nuclear weapons too. So we, we have to, I mean, the whole Middle East is a, you know, very difficult situation. It's in a lot of flux. Trump did try to reach out and have some agreements with Arab Gulf countries. Um, but the, a lot of the Arab countries are, you know, anti-Iran. And, you know, so, I mean, I, I don't know how this is going to play out. I, I do think having an anti-nuclear agreement for Iran not to keep building nuclear weapons is a good idea. I mean, nuclear energy, you know, nuclear power, um, which could be converted is a good thing. Um, but, I, you know, I, we're going to have to see how all this plays out. I guess there's so many issues right now. I mean, we're facing a myriad of issues. Do you want to say anything about Cuba yourself that you could share? Yeah, Cuban, doc <clears throat> Cuban doctors have been working all over the world. Yeah. And doing amazing work. And the US blockade is making it difficult for them to get the supplies they need. And the sanctions on Iran makes it difficult for these it, it, the U.S. has sanctions on all these countries that are struggling to save their people from Corona. Right. No, thank you. Yeah. No, this is a, this is another big problem. I mean, Cuba is known for creating a lot of medical people, right? I mean, that, that this is an area they they've been very good at. I actually think, Carol Francis, that you should come up with a speaker who has done some study on this and let's, let's hear that. I think that would be a fascinating 
uh, presentation for a Friday forum. Thank you. I'm working on it. Good. Uh, moving right along, these have been fascinating comments and questions. Uh, Steve Rohde and then Simon. Well, I uh, wanted in the minutes that I am deferring the opportunity to speak so that I can make space for Simon Simonian. Uh, <laughs> if there's time, I'll come back on the list. So I turn it over to Simon. Okay, Simon, you're up. Um, thank you, thank you, Linda, and thank you for all commentators. And thank you for ICUJP and George Regas, uh, who helped to found it with uh, two other people, including uh, uh, Beerman, uh, Rabbi Beerman, and another a group of people uh, in, uh, in, Pas in Pasadena. Now, um, a wonderful uh, talk, Linda, again, uh, very comprehensive, as everyone knows. Uh, now, how can we best deal with this coronavirus? I've had experience in eradicating the first disease in history which is looked upon as the most important mental and public health achievement in the history of medicine and public health, namely smallpox. Smallpox used to kill 5 million people each year, more terrible than COVID-19. And uh, the, the first vaccine for it was uh, found in 1796 in England by Dr. Edward Jenner, J-E-N-N-E-R. But uh, that was, uh, only effective, the vaccine was effective only for one day. So it was very difficult to transport it. Um, the second vaccine uh, I was involved with in the creating it in London University in the early 50s, 1950s, um, uh, with two other doctors. And uh, this vaccine was freeze dried and heat stable for one year on the shelf. And it could be transported without refrigeration and it was made from the virus itself type of thing. Um, whereas the um, two vaccines uh, currently discussed uh, uh, very much are the Pfizer and the Moderna, uh, which are made, as you mentioned, from RNA DNA for the first time. And they have to be refrigerated at very great temperatures and very difficult to transport to every part of the world, the poor, poor areas where you have to walk, you can't carry these uh, uh, carbon dioxide ice, you know, uh, to vaccinate a village, etc. So uh, we have to have something which is more uh, effective without refrigeration. And I think the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which is made from the virus, uh, modified virus, and again, England and, uh, and, and Oxford, of which I'm a graduate, and, uh, visiting professor and so on, uh, have the largest experience. So um, we have to look at this uh, modified virus and the AstraZeneca as the one that needs uh, uh, usually one injection at room temperature for transportation. Uh, and uh, uh, think about that as a, as a better possibility than the other two. Though I, I'm a friend of the founder of Moderna, Nubar Afeyan, an MIT graduate at PhD. Um, now, uh, regarding COVID-19, as we know, it may have started from an animal to human, bat to uh, uh, infected uh, e meat that's eaten by humans. And uh, the other thing we know about COVID-19 virus is that it mutates, as you mentioned, changes itself, uh, uh, like the uh, cold, common cold virus changes itself and uh, you can't make a virus, a, a, a vaccine against it easily. You have to change and make new vaccines. So knowing that about COVID-19, um, what we have to do is the experience we have from smallpox eradication, namely um, get world solidarity, as you mentioned. The WHO was involved very much with our vaccine. We took it up in Geneva, Switzerland and distributed it to all parts of the world, 195 countries so that uh, healthcare workers uh, were able to carry this in their pockets or you know in their uh, rucksacks uh, all over the world carry it in villages and so on and vaccinate everybody it took 10 years 
to do it uh, for all the 6 billion people at the time, uh, 1967 to 1977. The last case of smallpox from 5 million deaths and the vaccine, the, the virus, smallpox was more deadly in that if somebody got smallpox, one third died. Of 100 who got it, 30 died uh, from it. And as here, if 100 get it, maybe 1, 2, 10 up to the income from COVID-19. So once that was done, the last case of smallpox was in Somalia, East Africa, in a young cook who had been vaccinated and survived after a mild disease. So we have not had zero case of smallpox since 1977. Uh, so that's remarkable. Now to do it for COVID-19, what we have to do is uh, get a, the, a world united solidarity, even uh, for the smallpox, the Soviet Union, and the United States joined forces together through the World Health Organization, WHO, in order to get all the countries uh, be supplied with this virus and the, their healthcare workers and assistants go and vaccinate everybody in all parts of the world, villages, canoes, uh, to travel in waters, uh, to reach some areas which are unreachable. So unless we have world collaboration and solidarity, we are going to continue to have COVID-19. And because of the fast travel we have with airplanes, we cannot rely on not vaccinating the whole world. And these vaccine dissenters have certainly been retort that vaccines not only uh, save lives, but can eradicate disease. And they have been to be re-educated. And uh, so uh, those are some of my conclusions. Thank you, Simon. I mean, it's really fascinating. You've mentioned that before in our circle. And yet right now it comes to life because we're dealing with uh, another virus that's really global impact. So I'm afraid we are going to have to, we're at the end of our time, but so appreciate that. If anybody wants to um, talk more to Simon, you can you can send him an email. And thank you again, Linda, so much for your presentation.